So if we also look a bit further at sectoral concentration, we see higher concentration of workers in agriculture, construction and human health in the border region, in professional, scientific and technical activities in the Dublin regions, and in manufacturing, construction and agriculture in the West. In contrast, the proportions employed in professional, scientific and technical activities in the border and West regions and in manufacturing, construction and agriculture in the Dublin region are lower than the national average. So this translates to pay, with the Dublin region having the highest average pay and the border and West regions having the lowest and second lowest average pay, respectively. Non-Irish nationals in the border and West region are disproportionately concentrated in manufacturing, accommodation and food services, especially in the West, and wholesale and retail trade, and are significant, significantly underrepresented in education, human health, construction and public administration. In the Dublin region, non-Irish nationals are disproportionately concentrated in accommodation and food services and wholesale and retail trade, and significantly underrepresented in education, human health and public administration. These patterns show that in general, non-Irish nationals are disproportionately concentrated in sectors that have lower pay and underrepresented in sectors that are better paid and more likely to have better working conditions. Access to decent work matters for people's participation in society. It's not been easy for non-nationals to access certain, certain sectors of employment, particularly the sectors with better quality working conditions and pay. This is intensified in the border and West regions because of broader spatial inequalities in Ireland. So although national level data clearly shows the existence of sectoral concentration, the regional data we provide identifies the extent to which sectoral concentration and indeed sectoral exclusion is exacerbated based on where immigrants live. The ESR, ESRI report for COVID-19 and non-Irish nationals recently found that those who worked in occupations where their work could not be transferred to home had higher odds of remaining in employment. So we know that sectors such as accommodation and food service and wholesale and retail trade have high concentrations of non-Irish non nationals and would have been mostly unable to transfer such employment to a home environment. In the Irish context, Housing tenure is a particularly important indicator of social inclusion. Traditionally, levels of home ownership in Ireland were very high. As a consequence, the private rental market was seen as a short term option for most people and was relatively unregulated with limited availability of long term leases. However, this pattern has changed rapidly in recent years, and Ireland now is one of the highest rates of decline in home ownership in the EU. Earlier research suggested that immigrants were disproportionately concentrated in the private rental sector, where, in addition to insecure tenure, the cost of rent has been rising rapidly. This has consequences for social inclusion because tenants in the private rental market experience a consistent poverty rate almost three times higher than home, home owner occupiers. However, the ESRI report comments that there has been a large increase in home ownership across all migrant groups, suggesting that housing tenure indicators show improved integration outcomes for immigrants in Ireland. Again, we made a special request to the CSO to access information on housing tenure by region and nationality. There are differences between the three regions we were with a considerably higher proportion of home, home occupiers in the border and west regions and of renters from private landlords in the Dublin region. However, the most stark difference is evident in relation to nationality, with almost 48% of non-Irish nationals living in the border region, 54% in the West, and 67% in the Dublin region renting from private landlords, compared to 18% for the state as a whole. The reliance by non-Irish nationals on the private rental sector creates clear difficulties in relation to social inclusion because of the lack of long-term leases and the lack of predictability in relation to the cost of rent. There is a higher proportion of non-Irish national owner occupiers in the border and West regions than in the Dublin region, which may be linked to the different age profiles in this region and may also be linked to the lower cost of housing outside of Dublin. Dublin. However, we know that as a consequence of remote working, house prices have been rising nationally. There's also a higher proportion of non-Irish nationals living in local authority housing in both the border and the West regions, whereas in Dublin, the proportion of non-Irish nationals in local authority housing is considerably lower than the state average. The preponderance of non-Irish nationals living in private rental accommodation across all three regions is a cause for concern, particularly because access to so many services in Ireland, um, from voting to healthcare to education, assume a stable address. It's also important because of people in the private rental sector are, are at increased risk of homelessness. However, considering data at regional level points to important variations in access to, points to important variations in access to housing. In particular, the border and West regions may offer more opportunities for immigrants to secure their housing tenure, whether through home, own, home ownership or local authority housing, than is available to immigrants living in the Dublin region. 
So the differences highlighted matter in terms of the characteristics of the immigrants who choose to move to these regions and in terms of the opportunities that are available to them when they move. As a consequence, the integration outcomes for immigrants living in the border and west regions are less favorable, favorable in general than the integration outcomes for immigrants living in the Dublin region. A key difference relates to, key difference relates to the housing situation of immigrants in the border and west regions who appear to have slightly better security of tenure than their Dublin counterparts. However, other important indicators such as the unemployment rate and the at-risk at of poverty rate suggest that immigrants in the border region in particular are at a considerable disadvantage. Overall, though, it's important to note that immigrants living in the Dublin region are less disadvantaged than Irish nationals living in the border and west regions, suggesting that place plays a more important role in processes of immigrant integration than has been previously acknowledged. If our assessment of immigrant integ integration outcomes in Ireland continues to rely primarily on data aggregated to the national scale, we will miss these important spatial differences and likely not adjust integration policies and practices to better su support specific regional needs. In many instances, we had to make specific, uh, special requests to get the information because providing spatially disaggregated data by nationality is not considered a core requirement. A concerted effort is needed to insist on the importance of making data on immigrant integration publicly available at a range of spatial scales. We also suggest that paying attention to spatialized differences in immigrant integration outcomes provides better evidence for the structural barriers immigrants and others face, whether this relates to sectoral concentration in one region or housing, housing difficulties in another. This in turn allows for the development of more targeted responses by policymakers and by service providers that can provide support for addressing these inequalities. These outcomes, these outcomes that I've presented here are a snapshot in time. They need to be considered over a longer time period and in conjunction with other studies, both quantitative and qualitative. However, they serve the important function of showing spatial differen differentiation in integration outcomes using existing data sets. So they can be calculated relatively easily. If we were to approach the broader question of integration using a more nuanced spatial perspective, it's important that our work does not end with these measurements. Instead, we also need to see how places are changed by the presence of, migrant, of immigrants and how these processes in turn create or challenge further barriers to inclusion. So just to wrap up, I've, in this talk, I've concentrated on emphasizing that where immigrants live in Ireland matters and that there are specific needs for specific groups in regions across Ireland. I think this is important to keep in mind as we discuss the impact of the pandemic. Um, and there's other parts to our work that I'm happy to share in the question and answer se section. Um, but I'm excited now to hear from our other speakers um, and what they have to say. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for the talk, Jenny. Uh, hearing about the different needs of immigrants in different areas of Ireland is really, really interesting and very important research. So I can hear how passionate you are about your work as well. So it was really brilliant to hear and great to listen to. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Natalia MacDonald, Advocacy Officer at NASC. I'll hand it over to you there, Natalia. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, really, really good and important re research there by Dr. Jenny. <clears throat> really good to hear. I can definitely see, um, you know, the lack of supports um, and the concentration of like the services in the Dublin area versus all of the other parts of the country um, that, you know, maybe need some spread out. So today what I wanted to do is kind of focus on the logistics and the reality and the experiences of migrants that we've seen um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So one of the first things that was brought up was, um, you know, maybe migrant populations are in, um, jobs that uh, are maybe lower paying, um, which is true, but I wanted to focus on the precariousness of people's positions um, financially. Um, so to start with, um, one of the biggest things that, that we've seen is um, with travel restrictions and closures and everything like that, um, people's statuses and passports have been expiring and that has a knock on effect on um, their uh, ability to continue working or continue receiving payments, um, even things like renewing their driver's license and access to edu educational and healthcare. Um, so, uh, for example, like a person's passport would be um, expired, um, they might not have an embassy in Ireland, they'd have to travel, or uh, an embassy would have a delegation come to Ireland um, to renew people's passports, 
with the COVID restrictions, that was not very possible for most people. Um, so then if a person's passport is expired, then their residency permission is more difficult to renew. Um, the same thing with the residency permissions, although there have been automatic extensions by um, the Department of Justice of all permissions, that has not always been um, helpful um, for employers. Uh, some of the employers didn't understand the um, <clears throat> automatic renewals. Um, they just, you know, they saw that the person's card is expired and that's kind of it. Um, the Department of Social Welfare. We've also seen some people come in, um, get, get letters saying that their um, card is about to expire, they need to get a new one, um, but uh, in effect, they're actually covered. So there's just that lack of communication there. Um, one of the biggest things uh, for young adults and children was access to SUSE, which is still an issue. Um, Although people's permissions, again, are um, automatically extended, Susie's still looking for the Gina V cards, and it's more of a box ticking exercise. Um, I've, I've talked to my colleague who works with young people, and I think she's had at least five cases um, where they're just not successful because they couldn't renew um, their permissions. And then lastly, access to health care, uh, again, with person's permission expiring or a passport expiring, uh, they might lose their medical card, they might not be able to renew their medical card because um, you know, the, the, it's taking a long time or you know, other, other reasons. And so those are kind of the big issues that we've seen um, in the precariousness uh, that some settled um, Irish people might not experience. Um, and even though there were Kind of safeguards are, uh, around it, uh, they didn't necessarily work. Um, the next thing is the travel restrictions, um, just on the, you know, besides the passport, on the family side of, of it, uh, had a huge impact on migrant populations as well as Irish nationals who have family outside. Uh, so I think the biggest and most probably disproportionate, I would say, um, situation was uh, requiring visas for countries, lots of the South American countries that did not previously require visas. And then shortly after closing the visa processing for nearly all visa applications, um, although there was still the mandatory hotel quarantine in place. So one example was a, a family, um, a young mom um, and her daughter that were Irish and they came back. And when they're partnered, they're just about to get a, a visa stamp on their passport. Uh, well, unfortunately, the embassy closed for about five months at the beginning of this year, um, and they were not able to get the visa. So in total, I believe that family was separated for nearly a year, which was really difficult emotionally. Um, uh, multiple calls, so many calls about people just, you know, missing their family, not being there for them. Um, in, in such a difficult time with the pandemic, worrying about their families. Um, you know, if, if someone had a medical emergency, they couldn't go visit. Um, and those kind of situations were quite difficult. Um, uh, next would be, yeah, again, I've, I've touched on, on, on the children, migrant children um, impact that they, they've experienced. Um, first of all, with Susie not being able to um, get the grants that they needed and potentially continue their degree programs. Uh, lots of issues with um, tech. Um, so families not being able to um, connect to, to Zoom or have the facility to, uh, like even the space themselves to, to continue their lessons, not having the internet or the technology and phones and computers and things like that. Um, the other thing that was mentioned was language regression for migrant children, so they're no longer going to school, no longer speaking with um, uh, kids their age, they're just in their families, and then their English uh, uh, level of English kind of goes down. Um, direct provision was, I'd say, very hard hit by the pandemic. We've supported lots of people in the local DP centers. 
Um, and, and that was very difficult with either the constant, you know, close quarters and especially the kind of the first few months where it was, it was pretty scary, I think, for most people and, and pretty stressful. And then uh, going on to constant testing um, of, uh, you know, the population there. Um, I've spoken to people that I think were tested maybe 12 times in a short period of time um, and then constant lockdowns as well, which was really difficult on people's mental health. Um, <clears throat> uh, we would have uh, people that maybe were moved to a, an isolation center, um, you know, had to go through self-isolation, which was again, mentally very difficult, then moved to a different center, again, had to go to self-isolation, even though they just finished their, their two weeks. Um, and there, that was happening multiple times. So that would be like people in self-isolation for about a month, um, sometimes and sometimes maybe more, uh, which is definitely not fair. Um, and overall, um, the biggest issue is the slow processing of, of everything. So from the, the GNIB registrations, the IRP registrations, from PPSNs, um, renewals, even passport applications. I think um, many have heard that the passport applications for everyone are taking a long time. Um, but just to highlight that uh, for families coming in um, last year, so that would be 2020, maybe June, August, it would take up to maybe 12 to 16 weeks to get a PPSN. Um, and then similar amount of times, especially in Cork, uh, to get registered with their um, immigration permission. So in that span of time, when a family comes in, um, they have you know, no access to uh, a medical card. Uh, they, um, they can't be put like on a housing list, especially. So the family is kind of in limbo and in a really, really precarious situation as well. Um, so I suppose overall, the biggest uh, issues that I've seen is kind of a lack of communication um, between the departments and just with, with the population in, in, in general. Um, difficult to understand, especially with, with, with direct provision communications. Um, the, the information would have been not in simple English, it would have been very technical, um, hard to understand for someone whose um, English is a second, is a, is a second language. Um, and um, one of the positive things that we have seen, especially in direct provision, is um, the IPASS, the accommodation services going to the Department of Children and even a small, um, small way with, um, with communication and um, a lot more friendly, um, just small things like we understand your situation is difficult, things like that. So it wasn't as dry and it's, it was a little bit more fun, friendly. And I think that makes that kind of human touch does make an impact. Um, and it is really, really important um, in, in communication as well. Um, so those are kind of the the big the big things that I wanted to highlight. If anyone has any questions, they can um, let me know, and I can go into more details. I definitely have a, a few examples that I can um, I can pull out, and then I'll leave the rest to Brian as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalia, um, for sharing the experience of every people you've worked with and hearing about families being separated and so affected by COVID is really heartbreaking to hear. But thank you so much for sharing everything. And we'll give uh, time for questions after everyone's spoken, if that's all right. Brilliant. Uh, so, uh, hi, James. I just want to welcome you to the panel today. Uh, are you OK to speak next or should I leave you to last? Sorry, you're on mute there, James. Uh, James, you're on mute. It's 
no worries. We'll come back to you. We'll go to Brian Killorn next. I'll yeah. just. Okay, I'm on the. No, sorry, but I had a few usual. No worries. Problem. Okay, now look, guys. Um, I'm not quite sure why why I was invited to join this panel. Um, I um, am no particular ex expert on on the, the particular aspects of migration that you're talking about. Um, but um, I, I guess that the most, the, the only important thing that I, I could contribute is I, was, I have been doing some research on essential workers in the, in, the, in the pandemic crisis. And I think the thing that comes out there, which is, I, I imagine everybody in the room will, will know, um, but I think it's nonetheless important to stress is that uh, for for uh, em migrants, immigrants are, are, are of course concentrated um, in jobs that are precar usually precarious, uh, crucially, uh, which don't have union organisation, which don't have uh, the normal sorts of employment protection that is provided by a, a quote re regular job. Now, in when the pandemic started, uh, a lot of people. Uh, <clears throat> were were of course laid off because many many migrants work in the hospitality sector so it's not the case that there's a sort of neat equation between essential workers working your and and and, and immigrants uh, that the, there are the, the categories if you like cross cut but and this is the point within a, a essential workers uh, the immigrants tend not completely but tend to be clustered in areas where uh, they really are, if you like, voiceless. And I think this is what, what really is important to understand uh, about the, the general situation of essential workers in, in, the, in the crisis. People who get, who get working, some of them uh, have, if you like, public recognition. Some of them uh, have union organisation. Some of them are in regular jobs. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of people in the, in the healthcare sector, uh, but also, if you like, uh, people in large retail. Uh, <clears throat> suddenly, well, we, the rest of us recognise retail workers as essential. And they were, if you like, publicly recognised, socially recognised, quite significantly. Quite a few of the large companies actually uh, gave sort of uh, pandemic bonuses, um, <clears throat> even to those areas where there, no, where there isn't trade union representation. Uh, the same thing applies in transport, for, uh, transport, but it dramatically applies in the core of the healthcare sector, uh, where people are organised, where people are have uh, were able to make their concerns uh, known. By contrast, uh, there are two er areas which everybody in the room will be very familiar with, uh, where the, the, the significant number of migrants who are, if you like, completely silenced. That is number one, uh, the whole meat processing area, and number two, uh, the whole area of, if you like, residential home care. Uh, in those areas, what is quite both of which, of course, became absolute breeding grounds. Uh, for for the for the for the virus during the pandemic and still remains so. Uh, and what is really noticeable is that in those areas, the people concerned had no voice. There was no organisation, no way in which what was happening uh, was brought into the public sphere. Uh, and I think, uh, <clears throat> and, and furthermore. Uh, and if you if you look at in particular the meat processing area, and I'm just I'm not quoting from research I've done mainly from research that the MSCI has done. Uh, you know, it, it's quite amazing that there's the health protection in terms of, of food food quality and all, all that sort of stuff is is it's quite tightly regulated. Sector, but working conditions, forget it. Uh, and the same to a slightly different way applies in the residential home care. Uh, so I think the point I would want to make is that the, the, the pandemic highlighted the fact uh, that certain key areas of, of the economy depend on people who, as I say, are voiceless uh, and, and, uh, and let's be honest, are quite deliberately silenced uh, by their employers and by um, uh, and that is tolerated by, by the political system. I, I think. 
you know, I, I'm sure everybody in the room is only too well aware of that, but I think it has to be made a political, I think it would be good if it, that was made something that was actually talked about in, in, in public discussion. Hope that's of some use to you anyway. Thank you so much for the talk, James. And I have to apologize there, I didn't give you a proper introduction. Uh, James Wickham is a fellow emeritus at Trinity College Dublin. Thank you so much, James. It was really, really insightful. Uh, sorry now. And up next, we have Brian Killoran. He is CEO at uh, Immigrant Council of Ireland. You can take it away there, Brian. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to, to be here this evening. Um, um, and thank you to those who've spoken already. Um, I'm going to slightly follow a similar vein, I think, to what Natalia has said already, as, as service providing organisations ourselves in the Immigrant Council and NASC down in Cork. I think a lot of the same things presented to us as organisations uh, over the last two years. Um, so I suppose as a frontline non-governmental organisation and independent law centre, um, uh, offering services to migrant communities in Ireland for, for 20 years now. Um, I guess we're, we're well placed in that regard to, to give a, a barometer to a certain extent of some of the issues um, that you're discussing this evening. Um, and I think the overarching theme that I would draw attention to is that the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic um, and its associated impact has, uh, has had both on the lives of migrant communities in Ireland um, and the services with which they interact uh, cannot be overstated um, and in many ways has magnified and intensified some of the long-standing issues uh, in how we as a state support migrants here. Um, in 2020 and 2021, the administration of our immigration system in Ireland um, strained under the pressure of its own bureaucratic nature and in some instances completely ground to a halt, um, not only for those seeking to come to Ireland, but for those uh, for whom Ireland is home. Um, a prominent issue, as Natalia um, um, referenced already, regards the registration of non-EEA nationals le legally residing in Ireland on various types of immigration permissions, um, with the closure of the Burkey Registration Office in Dublin on, under the public health restrictions and the associated closure of registration offices around the country, those who needed to renew their immigration permission were able to, to were unable to do so. Um, and a situation, you know, the fallout of which were, were still persists to this day. Um, the Department of Justice did, as Natalia said earlier, and, and correctly um, issue statements regarding you know, confirming blanket renewals of all immigration permissions to those impacted, but the inability to have an in-date registration card uh, caused and continues to cause huge problems. Um, our services um, have seen people who have lost their job as their card had expired and their employer did not understand the situation and did not want to do anything wrong. Um, we have seen people interview for roles with um, for which they were successful in getting, but could not take up um, as they couldn't convince the, an employer of the nature of their legal residency in the state, again, without a registration card. And we've seen repeatedly um, people go to social welfare offices and be asked to produce a valid and in-date certificate of registration, something uh, which it was impossible for them to do through no fault of their own. Um, and while we may say that this, is, uh, this issue is a moment in time during a pandemic, it also highlights for us more endemic issues um, that predate the pandemic, uh, pandemic. Firstly, the overall bureaucratic and paper-based nature um, of many of our immigration processes. Secondly, the lack of clarity regarding rights and entitlements, which often accompanies a person's immigration status. And thirdly, the issue of communication and coordination across government departments um, regarding an individ individual status and the rights that flow from that status. Um, it's true that the pandemic was and continues to be a uniquely difficult scenario for all, including government departments, but it's also true to say that it has magnified an existing need that we and others in civil society have been calling for for many years, um, the need to modernise and reform our immigration system in Ireland. Um, we have noted um, this year and welcome the fact that the Department of Justice have identified immigration reform as a priority in its current action plan from 2021 to 2023. And we welcome the opportunity to, to feed into that from our experience, as I'm sure many other organizations and uh, migrant-led groups will as well. Um, 
uh, I suppose as regards the team, as regards the overall team of this meeting, um, as has been touched upon by um, Dr. Jenny and by Natalia earlier on as well. You know, we need to highlight the reality, I suppose, that a, a person's integration experience in Ireland is often, um, uh, not often, is, is always, I think, intrinsically linked to their immigration status and the rights which flow from it. Um, immigration status underpins access to basic services. It, it underpins pretty much everything somebody will do, particularly for those from outside the EEA who are subject to the immigration system. Um, a lot of the issues that I've mentioned earlier on regarding the administration of our immigration system and everything that flows from it then in terms of rights and entitlements have been magnified 10 times over for persons in particular vulnerability within the immigration system. So those with indirect provision, victims of human trafficking, for example, unaccompanied minors, um, um, and also those who are undocumented and those who are outside the immigration system. So undocumented migrants and their interaction with services was it was a um, uh, a huge issue I, I think for a lot of services like our own throughout the pandemic. Um, um, you know, one of the one of the areas that was highlighted earlier is that the, the predominance um, in some occasions of people from a migrant background in what were deemed essential services. Um, people having to travel then to go from their homes to their employment, fearful of guarded checkpoints and um, worried that they will be asked about their immigration status while they're going to their job as an essential worker. Um, this prompted us to write to the Garda commissioner and urge them to, to put out a communication that no immigration status checks will take place as part of Garda checkpoints throughout the pandemic um, to make um, to give some assurance to those that were traveling for employment that they wouldn't be asked about their immigration status. So while they assured us of this in private, they didn't put that information out into the public, which is problematic because obviously certain certain people will reach organizations such as ourselves, um, but not, um, not everybody. Um, so I, I think that kind of example for undocumented migrants um, can be re replicated across many services that they were accessing as well. Some good communication was done regarding undocumented people accessing things like tests and, and vaccinations. But again, it was kind of a one size fits all uh, strategy as regards um, the uh, health information that was relayed to the general public um, and not particularized and not targeted in, in particular ways towards migrant communities. And I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second. Um, but to touch upon um, issues in direct provision, um, and Natalia has touched upon them already, um, and, and I'm sure can speak to them in more detail from the work of NASC. Um, but I suppose I'd like to draw attention to some of the work that we do with uh, people with indirect provision, and that tends to mainly be victims of human trafficking. So the, the state policy as regards victims of human trafficking, once they're identified in the state, is to accommodate them in direct provision centers. So we as an organization and many others have been long critical of this approach um, to house, for example, a victim of sexual exploitation in a mixed gender um, mm -hmm. Um, uh, accommodation center in a shared room with three other people um, down the country somewhere away from services and supports is, is simply not the right place to have somebody who's recovering from extreme trauma and PTSD. Um, and again, if you can imagine the circumstance then during the pandemic and during lockdown, um, the issues that our, our clients, the clients of our legal team faced were essentially, you know, being in a mixed gender shared room accommodation in lockdown conditions or sometimes with small children while schools or any options of childcare were closed, trying to homeschool, trying to conduct interviews and consultations with their legal advisors, trying to continue uh, to comply with Garda investigations into their traffickers and trying to access any integration supports whatsoever, you know, in terms of any access to possibilities of employment or education, psychosocial and mental health supports. All of these things were completely off the cards and, and completely um, undermined by their position uh, within direct provision during the pandemic, which again, just magnifies the overall inappropriateness, not just of having victims of trafficking within direct provision, but also direct provision as a whole. And, and hopefully we will see that abolished over the next couple of years because it, it needs to be. Um, so essentially this was a time of extreme isolation and difficulty for you know our clients at the moment in, in, in the Immigrant Council, we have 28 clients of our legal team who are victims of human trafficking, all women, 
and all having gone through experiences of, of extreme sexual exploitation and uh, in many cases you know dealing with the fallout of that through trauma and PTSD um, and the pandemic has just magnified that again and again so I suppose um you know, one of the things we've tried to do as an organization as well, um, through our integration work in particular, we see ourselves, so on the one side of the organization, we're a legal service and, and we provide legal services and free legal representation um, as an independent law center. The other side of our house is our integration work and we see that largely as being a platform. So we offer ourselves as a national organization to try and amplify migrant voices in Ireland and provide training and capacity building to migrant leaders and migrant communities through that work. Um, and over the last two years, we've sought to use that work to amplify some of the issues raised by migrant leaders and migrant led groups uh, throughout the pandemic. So one example of that is the We Are Here Too campaign, um, which has been running in 2020 and 2021, which essentially grew out of our, our Leadership Academy in 2020, where a group of 16 migrant women were, were trained in our Leadership Academy um, by Teresa Bukowska and others, um, our integration manager. Um, Domestic violence issues against migrant women were, was a team that emerged from the Leadership uh, Academy and how some migrant women were in extremely marginalized situations, not accessing mainstream services, um, but being supported within their own communities by other women um, who were from those communities and trying to you know, signpost and refer them to, to mainstream services. Um, so through that work, which we, 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 we launched the We Are Here Too campaign. We now have a project called Community Navigators, which has trained migrant women to go back into their own communities and signpost and support vulnerable women to go towards um, uh, go towards uh, domestic violence and gender-based violence services. But that is, again, a situation extremely made more difficult by the pandemic. Um, just recently this week, we supported Forum Polonia, the, the Polish, um, one of the Polish representative groups, in highlighting how Polish and, and overall migrant communities have been left out in, of pandemic responses in terms of support. Um, and also one of the issues they wanted to raise was in terms of particularized vaccine related information, um, which leads me, I think, to, to my last point um, or my second last point um just like to name i suppose some of the issues that that migrant communities have been have been relaying to us around um the communication of health and in particular vaccine related information to migrant communities um, and the deficiencies in that um of late so it's not just an issue of information, but one of challenging disinformation within within certain sections of migrant communities. And obviously disinformation is not, you know, con con uh, not um, what's the word, confined to migrant communities. Disinformation around vaccines, unfortunately, is, is an issue with the whole public conversation around it. But particularized responses for, for migrant communities um, and the disinformation that is, is going on in those communities as well um, is needed from the Irish public health authorities. Um, so a migrant led uh, strategy is needed in this area and needs to be devised by the health, uh, health um, services to respond to that issue. Um, you know, engaging with migrant led organizations, leaders, and migrant relevant media um, targeted to address the shortfalls in the communication strategy in the last two years. Um, so, so that's a flavor, I suppose, of some of the issues that we've been seeing as an organization. And, and just to highlight, I suppose, two, two big things that are going, uh, going to come up now in 2022, and one of them was launched today. One of them is the, the scheme for Afghan communities in Ireland to apply for family members to come and join them in Ireland um, through, through a, a scheme that was just launched today. Um, that will be made more difficult, I think, by the continue not just the situation in Afghanistan, but the continuing difficulty of, of getting documents and paperwork in, in the current varying states of lockdowns in both Ireland and, and different countries over, over the next few months. And the undocumented regularization scheme then after, after um, Christmas in, in 2022, it will be a real opportunity, hopefully, for um, you know maybe several thousand people in situations of undocumented status to, to come out and, and get gain a regularization through this scheme um, and again hopefully services like our own will be in position to be able to actually support them properly um, but again the pandemic public health guidelines will impact that as well um, so maybe just just some you know current issues to, to finish up with um, so thank you very much thank you so much Brian it was great to hear you talk you can tell how important the topics are to you it's really interesting to hear um, as you and Natalia are both service workers, service providers, sorry, it's, you've definitely seen firsthand some just how affected people are by these. 
And obviously, as you said, it's only bringing light to light a lot of issues that were already present. So hopefully there will be change in the future. And I can tell that you're doing really important work to make sure that that happens. Um, I'll just ask if any of the panelists have any questions for each other about what they've spoken about. No one? Oh, Jenny. I, I just want to say that I was really impressed by hearing about the experiences on the ground and the everyday issues that you've been, you know, dealing with Natalia and and, and Brian in particular. I, I think there's loads of things I could ask. There's a lot of issues there that you're facing um, and that immigrants are facing in Ireland. I just picked up on digital exclusion, really, and accessible information um, as two big major issues um even though there's other there's lots of other major ones but i wondered if there was any instances of best practice or good examples that you've seen of ways in which you know perhaps migrants were provided with with some sort of you know the ways in which you overcame digital exclusion or you know examples of good accessible information at any stage during the pandemic is there anything to positive to point towards i guess mm. for either mm -hmm. natalia or brian or brian i don't mind I can, I can have a go first, Natalia, if, if, if that's okay. Um, just there's two things that pop to mind, I suppose, and I'm sure you probably will be familiar with other things as well. Um, the Community Foundation did a, um, at one stage in 2020 issue a grant call um, to organizations who were trying to support people in direct provision around access to digital services. So again, like we said, um, kids not being in school and being homeschooled, but you know, not everybody has iPads and not everybody has laptops and computers or access to them or even access to good internet services, you know. Um, so the community foundation did it did a, a funding round for that in 2020. And I'm not sure of the outcomes of it, but I know a good few organizations did apply for um uh, grants under that to support people in direct provision to get some improvement of their digital situation but that was kind of a once-off as regards that um as regards good health information um as i said while the overall strategy was very um generalized and you know it was one size fits all essentially um some people took it upon themselves to to do work and translate ireland a group that emerged actually down in cork and um, natalia i'm sure will be very familiar mm, with them. the sanctuary runners uh, isn't it yeah, it's Graham Clifford, who set up Sanctuary Runners as well, um, gathered together a number of healthcare professionals and continues to translate health-related health information. But again, is, is doing so pretty much, he might have got a small grant off the HSE at one stage, but continues to pretty much do it. They continue to pretty much do it off their own bat, you know, and again, it's not, it's not a nationwide strategy. It's really just an initiative that people come up with themselves to do, you know? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was going to mention the, the Sanctuary Runners um, translation. I think in general, what happened just with lots of organizations is the, uh, the fact that we were working from home. Um, and I think a lot of organizations were using WhatsApp, which I think is really popular in the migrant uh, communities. I did find that to be helpful um, in language. Uh, so with, with clients that might not be really, really fluent in English, WhatsApp was really, really helpful because then we can just translate and understand each other. Um, you know, not perfectly, but it, it was still a little bit more accessible uh, because most people do have a phone. They might not have a, you know, a computer or be able to fill out forms. That, 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 is, that is a big thing uh, with the di digitalization that's happening at the moment. But WhatsApp is fairly user friendly. So that was one, one positive thing for sure. Thanks. Does anyone have anything else that they wanted to ask? Can I, uh, can I ask other people in the panel uh, a question? Yeah, of course. Um, one of the things that in international comparison makes Ireland look actually rather good is this insistence uh, on a Chinese wall between for applicants to the PUP uh, and, and uh, Department of Justice. Um, you know, I thought that was, that was pretty impressive and, and that was seen elsewhere as a a very sensible and obvious thing to do, but actually required quite a lot of political courage, I think. Uh, but does anybody have any experience of report? Can anybody report on any experience of how that actually worked in practice? How easy was it for people to access the PUP? Um, 
Sorry, I, I, I should have. Is, is it okay for me to I, yeah. I'll jump, just just from the service provision mm-hmm. again? Um, yeah, like you say, I suppose it was one of the few instances. So like I mentioned earlier the immigration, you know, the guard of checkpoints and, and undocumented mm-hmm. people. They wouldn't say that publicly, you know. They they, they wouldn't um, they wouldn't go out and say that. But they kind of said in practice, we won't do it. But the the example you gave regarding the, the access to the PUP, where that was said publicly, was really good. You know, that was really welcome, and that and we all welcomed that at the time. Mm-hmm. As well, um, in terms of of practical access to it, um, we didn't see any issues with it. it. It seemed to go pretty well. There were instances, though, in particular. There's a very maybe a particular cohort um, that we would work with through our services, and that was migrant women in situations of prostitution who didn't have any access. They're not working in regular uh, regular employment. Where they were undocumented, and they couldn't access any supports whatsoever, basically, mm. because they couldn't access the PUP. They couldn't access anything like that. And I know like other groups like Ruhama um, would have said the same, like that while while in general undocumented people had good access to the PUP, there were certain categories mm-hmm. within that where there was no, no access whatsoever. And there was lots of appeals made by organizations to say, make this available. This is an exit strategy now for women in prostitution um, who are undocumented, but it just never happened and never got off the ground. So that's that's one example I would have of somewhere where it didn't work. You know, um, so I don't know if, if Natalia or, or anyone else would know. No, I think more the difficulty, uh, and like, I'm not sure because I don't think I only had a couple of cases and they did not get back, uh, is for people that didn't have a PPSN. Mm. So I'm not sure, Brian, if you've had any success or cases of people trying to get the POP if they did not have a PPSN. Because um, that, that seemed like one of the difficulties, mm. but... Uh, I, we didn't we, yeah we didn't have contact later contact with the client to find out whether it was successful or not um no yeah I, I actually I'm not sure if we if we saw any instances of that either but I think I think um I think our experience with undocumented people probably similar to your own is that a lot of the time they have managed to get a PPSN probably more often than not because they started off in a situation mm-hmm. of being legally resident and then segued into undocumented status. So, so, but I, I haven't come across, I don't, I, our services team would tell you better now if, if they, if they had instances where not having a PPSN was, was an issue, but I think it's, I think it's a good example overall though of how, maybe under extreme circumstances, state responses can be tailored to support the ideas of just giving services to undocumented people and, and you know, and responding quickly and responding compassionately. And as, as James said, with a bit of political uh, political courage. Um, and again, the regularization scheme announced this year now and the impact that will have next year is another, another example, I think, of political courage, although on the back of, you know, 10 years of campaigning by undocumented people themselves, mm. you know, so... And um, so, so it's it's in some ways maybe the pressure cooker of pandemic has has allowed for certain things like the regularization scheme to happen and become politically possible. And um, because certain things like that, that you know the the division of of uh, information and the access to it for undocumented people happened during the pandemic. So maybe in some ways this pressure cooker has nudged us mm-hmm. towards a better response around certain things in migration too. You know. I mean, very optimistic there. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, everyone. So we're going to move on to a Q&A now, if that's all right. Uh, the first question we have is for Brian. Uh, was there anything that inspired you to work in this field? Um, true story. When I, I was in... Um, uh, the US after I, I, I studied and I came back to Ireland in 2004 I was working on international programs in the US and I came back to Ireland in 2004 in the run-up to the 2004 citizenship referendum um, which was about removing birthright citizenship in Ireland and I came back to this whole media storm essentially um, denigrating um, you know being horrendous about migrant communities in Ireland and how plain loads of pregnant African women were showing up to give birth and just, you know, access citizenship for their children. And it was a travesty. The political narrative around it was completely, um, completely wrong and completely overblown and exaggerating the issue in, in an enormous sense. And for me, actually, that was that was 
that was my interest in the area going, hold on a second. I think we can be a little bit better than this as a country. And this, this cannot be how Ireland receives the migrant community. So actually it was coming back to the pre-2004 citizenship referendum um, that really kind of inspired me to start working in this area because I was just, you know, horrified, I suppose, at what we were what we were doing as a country back then, you know. And still, you know, that referendum was passed uh, largely on the back of fear and misinformation, essentially, you know, on prejudice um, and remains the case now that we don't have birthright citizenship in Ireland anymore. So um, so we hopefully get back around to addressing that at some stage. Hopefully, yeah, that is a that's a really great story about how you got started in it. for a country where so many people emigrate there. There's not a lot of understanding for immigrants. Um, uh, the next one is for Jenny. Uh, do you have any opinions about the housing situation for incoming migrants during the pandemic? I think a lot of work needs to be done. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of impetus for housing policy at the moment. Um, I think maybe Natalia and Brian might know more about, um, you know, regular helping and assisting um, immigrants that are renting in the rental sector between, you know, if they're in pressure zones or facing discrimination from landlords, I imagine there's cases and instances ongoing, um, whether that can be reported, whether there's a complaints mechanism. Um, I'm sure there's lots of issues around having a stable address in terms of employment. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that's being addressed at the moment, um, but I know that there is, there is media coverage and, and political will to do something there. Um, but what I don't know exactly. I don't know if Natalia, if you have experience of the rental sector. Yeah, really, really difficult uh, for people, um, you know, just getting out of direct provision, um, finding accommodation. I know it's really difficult in Dublin, really difficult in Cork and it's just, you know, becoming more difficult. Uh, the tricky thing is that, you know, people do want to stay in, in like the Cork city or Dublin city because that's where the supports are. Uh, you know, they're not very interested in going uh, to more of the like uh, small, small towns, because then that's difficult for them to, again, integrate and then get the supports that they need, especially starting out. The other thing is that people would uh, like exiting direct provision. Um, people would tend to go to maybe a house share and then apply for family members. And sometimes families can be big. And then it's really hard to, uh, to find the appropriate housing for them. But the, the thing is that they, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be on um, the, the social housing list. They have to be on the social housing list to get half payments. But then the family has to come in to be added on um, the, the list so their HAP can be increased so then they can afford to move into a bigger place. And then COVID also has an impact on, on that with families coming in, not being able to get their PPSN uh, for weeks and weeks at a time um, and not, be, not have access to emergency accommodation because they don't have a PPSN. It's just such a struggle. Um, yes, definitely instances of like racism and, and uh, uh, people having a really difficult time finding accommodation, maybe because they have a different name or they speak with an accent, but really hard to pin down because there are so many other applicants, you know, all they have to say, uh, you know, letting agency or a landlord, all they have to say is we have we have another applicant. I did notice at least one letting agency when I was looking for housing myself uh, had a question of what the nationality is of a person, which is, for them, it was like, you know, the full picture of the tenant is needed for the landlord. I think that's absolutely unnecessary. Um, in other in other works, uh, in other jobs that I've had, I've, I've seen um, people of non-EA uh, ask for, a, being asked for a higher deposit, they, you know, well, other, other, other nationals were not asked for a higher deposit, uh, things like that. But unfortunately, with my talk with Threshold as well, really hard to pin down and report. It's just kind of everyone knows it exists, mm. but, you know, what can you do about it? Thank you, Natalia. Um, the next question we have is for James. Uh, how do you think the working conditions for working migrants in Ireland can be improved? 
I was just about to leave, actually. Um, I, 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 I do think the, the, the simplest and most important thing is actually trade union organisation. You know, and I know it's very difficult and I know there's been, you know, mixed, uh, 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 continuing attempts to organise in these areas. Uh, but I think, <clears throat> but I think that that realistically is is the way uh, where things can be improved because it, because conditions can be improved if people have voice and can and at the moment most most of the areas we're talking about people are voiceless and you need something like a union to protect you uh, a, um, to protect you when you need to speak out. I think the other thing is, there is an, also an issue around uh, the proper enforcement of employment protection legislation and, and in and particular work work safety legislation. And the simple fact of the matter is that in Ireland, uh, we we, we have the, the regulations aren't too bad. Uh, they're just in many cases they're not enforced. Uh, the, the famous joke is that there are more, there are, I don't know whether it's true any longer, but at one stage we were commenting on the fact there are more dog, more uh, inspectors of dogs uh, than inspectors of, of workplaces. Um, you know, this is, the, there was a brief occasion in the, under the pr previous one government when employment uh, rights were, an agency was created to enforce employment rights and it's magically been di dissolved. You know, so I think, uh, so those two things, Number one, union organisation. Number two, actually enforcing the existing regulations. Thank you so much, James. And then the last question here is for Natalia. Uh, what can we do as a community to support the lives of migrants during the pandemic? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the issues are more kind of systemic, you know. Um, uh, it's, it's been difficult for everyone. I, I suppose uh, the one thing that I could say is uh, join a community sponsorship group. So uh, we, do, we do have community sponsorship groups. Um, it's uh, people getting together in their local community and uh, sponsoring a refugee family coming into Ireland. So that would be um, finding housing uh, for them um, once they come in, you know, kind of showing them around, helping with all of the applications and just supporting uh, a family together and just welcoming them into a community. So instead of going into more of like an institutionalized uh, direct provision type uh, situation, they're going right into the community and they're integrating with the people um, right in there. So I think that's one very possible way to do it. I do understand the housing crisis is difficult, uh, but we've had many, uh, you know, successful, su successful groups starts and it's just, you know, you make new friends with the, the local people that are there in your neighborhood and as, as well with the com family coming in. So I think that's one, one good way to do it. Really great advice. Thank you, Natalia. If anyone has any final thoughts that they would like to share about our talk today, please go ahead now. Maybe if I could just come in on, on that last question as well, I suppose, like one of, one of the, the biggest impediments to reform around migration and integration in Ireland is that most political representatives don't think that the Irish public care. Um, and the polling doesn't support that you know any polling that's been done into migration in Ireland has showed that overwhelmingly Irish people are positive about migration and diversity there's like the top 25 percent who are negative and you know won't be moved from that but we're talking 60 to 70 percent positive attitudes towards migration and I think that's beginning to to become apparent to the political establishment um and things like the regularization scheme are, are an example of that, that they're kind of going, well, actually, maybe we can do this and we won't face a backlash. You know, maybe this would be OK if we do it. So I think, you know, becoming informed about um, what migrant communities themselves are saying. So like signing up for Facebook groups, signing up for newsletters, knowing what's going on, you know, doing the kind of simple local interaction as well. And, and you know, reaching out to people around you in the community. Um, 
connected in like that, but then as well taking on the opportunity to let a local political representative know, oh, by the way, oh, you're in the Green Party, oh, you know, you're in government right now, we want to see direct provision gone, you know, we want to see the next migrant integration strategy have proper funding behind it, and, um, you know, knowing local representatives hearing things like this are really important, because if they're hearing it locally, then they'll go in and say it in the doll, you know, otherwise they won't, you know. Um, so they need to know that the general public um, actually care about these issues and they need to be reminded about that, that again and again and again. So I think that's one thing that the general public can do is uh, make sure Leinster House knows that people want to see reform in these areas. Thank you so much, Brian. That was a really, really good note to end on, especially a hopeful one. If anyone has any other final thoughts? Okay, then we'll end our panel there today. Thank you so much, Devin, for coming. And thank you again to our speakers. You really bring insightful and informative information to these, and we really appreciate you for coming. Uh, just to let everyone know on our YouTube Live, uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. We would really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, for everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having us.